this is uh, this is my name and uh, you know I'm a child neurologist at uh, Mafraq Hospital I did my training at Ohio State University uh, Nationwide Children's Hospital in, in child neurology and I did my pediatric training at Texas Tech University at Amarillo Texas and I did a uh, touch of hematology oncology like only 14 months then I moved to child neurology uh, we're going to talk today about uh, uh, cerebral palsy uh, the first thing we're going to start with is what is cerebral palsy. Uh, in 2005, a committee of uh, the American Academy of Cerebral Palsy and Developmental Medicine, AACPDME, led by Peter Rosenbaum, defined CP as a group of disorder, so it is not one entity, mm -hmm. of the development of movement and posture causing activity limitation that are attributed to non-progressive disturbances that occurred in the developing fetal or infant brain, right? So it is non-progressive. This is why I underline it. If it is getting a progressively worse, it is not CP. The motor disorders of cerebral palsy are often accompanied by disturbances of sensation, cognition, communication, perception and or behavior and or seizure disorder. So cerebral palsy, you can diagnose the patient with cerebral palsy, but you need to look at the what else he has. We are dealing what are the, with the consequences of cerebral palsy, okay? Next, please. And the, and the sixth edition of the International Classification of Diseases Handbook, there are over 50 different classification of CP. The incidence of CB is considered to be 2 to 2.5 per 1,000 live births. And the diagnosis usually involves waiting for the definite and permanent appearance of specific motor problems. So don't diagnose CP by 4 months of age or 3 months of age. Okay. Why? Anyone know why? Because the main output from the brain is mainly inhibitory mm -hmm. for the first 6 months. And a lot of the time, you will see the patient, you examine him, he's, he's hypotonic. Even though you look at the MRI, he has severe hypoxic ischemic encephalopathy. But because the main output is inhibitory, you need just to keep following up them. And by the one year of old, you will find a lot of spasticity and uh, the signs of hypertonia will appear. Uh, next, please. Now, what are the clues to diagnosis of cerebral palsy? delayed milestones. Usually the kids would not be uh, meeting his uh, milestones uh, uh, persistent of a primitive reflexes. What are the primitive reflexes you guys know? Moro, asymmetric tonic knock and neck reflex, mm -hmm. sucking reflex, grasp reflex, starter. rotting reflex, starter, starter reflex, mm -hmm. and failure to develop protective reflexes such as parachute mm -hmm. response, or asymmetric movement. We love asymmetry in neurology. People who are symmetrical is, are not really exciting for us. If people who are skewed or asymmetrical, we love them because you know we know where to go, right? Where's the abnormality? So asymmetric movement, when you are watching the kid and the kid is, is kicking with his hands and legs and you, he's not kicking as hard with his right leg, uh, just like the left leg, then you know there's some problem, right? So asymmetry is very significant. Now, no progressive neurological diseases and no loss of milestones should be present. Why? Because if you see progressive neurological disease or loss of milestone, what are you going to think about? Neurodegenerative disorders, right? Mm -hmm. So uh, this one will take you to a, another route or another highway of your evaluation and also will t take a different prognosis. CB kids are usually are improving slowly or they are static, not improving. And sometimes they have pseudo regression, but because of the development, for example, of the, uh, of the hypertone when they reach the one year of age, most of the time. That is why you have to be aware of a change in exam that may, that may result from a growth and maturity, okay? Now, uh, 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 it is not unusual for a child with cerebral palsy to have hypotonia initially and then hypertonia. Why? We just said that. However, if a child has hypertonia initially 
and they become a hypotonic. A neurodegenerative disease should be searched. Like what? Give me just two examples. Metachromatic leukodystrophy. It can affect the central nervous system, so they become very stiff, and then I hit the peripheral nervous system, then they become hypotonic because we damage the nerves. Crab A disease, another example. Okay? We'll talk about this later on. It's a neurodegenerative disorder. That's a good example. Classification of cerebral palsy. There is 70% of uh, cerebral palsy are spastic. And you know spasticity? There is, uh, there is uh, cogwheel rigidity. Mm -hmm. And there's a clasp nine knife spasticity. Mm -hmm. The typical clasp knife spasticity is secondary to pyramidal system. Whether in the motor cortex, uh, corticospinal tract, spinal cord, the cogwheel rigidity, or what we call rigidity, is usually sign of what? Extra pyramidal system, like in part consumism, right. cogwheel rigidity. Now, what is you, the spastic, spastic uh, cerebral palsy? You divide them in bilateral spasticity, unilateral, and bilateral is the most common spastic diaplegia. Why? Because of prematurity. That's a lot of the time a question. The commonest is spastic diaplegia. Why? It is more prevalent in premature because of what? PVL, periventricular locomination, right? And where is the legs reside? In the paracentral area, right? This is where the motor cortex, uh, if you look at the homunculus, the, 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 the legs will be hanging in the medial side, right? So that's why a lot of the time you get hit in that, in that area. Spastic quadriplegia is the more severe form Usually, we see it in the hypoxic ischemic encephalopathy. Unilateral spasticity, spastic hemiplegia, a stroke. Most common in this form is the seizure. Monoplegia and triplegia, I have probably two or three patients of each, and it is uncommon, right? Now, spastic hemiplegia, stroke, spastic diaplegia, prematurity. Now, the extra perimeter or this kinetic uh, cerebral palsy is 10 to 15%. And it, it, is, it, is, it, it can show up like bradykinesia, which is what? Slow movement, mm -hmm. okay? Dystonia, abnormal sustained posture, right? Choreoacetosis, what is chorea? Rapid jerky movement. Rapid jerky movement. Acetosis, slow riding movement. Yeah. And uh, hemipalismus, abnormal flailing movement of one side of the body. Yeah. Now, choreoacetosis, the most common cause for choreoathetic disorder is chronicterus. It does not happen as much nowadays because we, we treat them with the phototherapy, exchange transfusion, so we don't reach to that level. Now there's a hypotonic, there's a taxi, ataxic, and there's mixed form. Now, you know, a lot of the time, you can have a spastic diaplegic kid or uh, uh, who is wheelchair bound, he cannot move at all, and uh, in another uh, patient, you can have a spastic diaplegia, but the kid can move and even can run. How can I classify them? Uh, and we can talk the same language, okay? If I tell you no visuality part, are you gonna understand me? Because, you know, we are not speaking the common language, right? That's the same way they develop the gross motor function classification system. This is to help, you know, uh, the physician, when they, when they put the patient in this level, they, the physician right away, spastic diabetes in this level, yeah, I know how, how bad is his CP. For example, GMFCC for children aged 6 to 12 years of, of age, description and illustration. Level 1, level 1 is basically, level 1 is, uh, uh, the kid almost, you know, is functional, he moves by himself. Level 2, he might need uh, uh, some assistant. Uh, level 3, of course, he need uh, more assistant, like in a wheelchair, but he can operate that, okay? He can use the crutches. Level 4, you can also, uh, level 4, you can, uh, you need more assistant, wheelchair bound. And level five pretty much completely dependent on his family, right? Mm -hmm. okay. Causes of cerebral palsy. What is the commonest cause of cerebral palsy? Prenatal cause, 75 to 80%. And I, I yeah, 75 to 80%. These are areas I highlighted. There are common questions for you guys. Mm -hmm. 
congenital abnormality, whether it is the, it's the first trimester or is it in the second trimester. Uh, 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 and uh, you, in first trimester, genetic, chromosomal, brain malformation, second or third trimester, intra-infection, intrauterine infection, problems in fetal or placental function, cause of cerebral palsy, perinatal, 10 to 15 percent, postnatal, 10 percent. If the patient is riding in the car, ra da dancing, and the, the, all of a sudden the, 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 the dad pushes the brake, right, and he hit his hip and develop bilateral injury and become spastic. And they have a patient like this, you still can call it spastic uh, cerebral palsy, mm -hmm. even though it's a postnatal, but that's not mm -hmm. as common. And not obvious cause is 30 percent. Now, if you go back, prenatal is 75 to 85. Perinatal, 10 to 15. How much now, almost 90? Postnatal, 10 percent. Not obvious 30 percent. So it's 130 percent. 130 percent of out one person. It's not because we are in the mafrag and we are generous. Of the obvious cause, we know that is it's the classification. And 70 percent, we know what's the, 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 the cause, right? Mm -hmm. And it's classified as 75, 15, and 10. Mm -hmm. And 30 percent, we don't know what's the cause. Mm -hmm. And we are going to talk about this because you really have to pay attention to that not obvious cause. Next. Mm -hmm. Differential diagnosis of cerebral palsy. And here, you know, uh, if you have a patient who does not have classical finding of cerebral palsy, no hypoxic ischemic encephalopathy, there is no prematurity, and the kid is spastic, then you, meet, you need to think of other disorder. Inborn error of metabolism, urea cycle defect, biotinidase deficiency, homocysteine, demethylation defect, cerebral folate deficiency, Cerebral tendinosis, xanthomatosis, dopamine syn synthesis defects. Uh, this is the inborn error of metabolism that can come or present as spastic, uh, spastic cerebral palsy and can mimic that. Tetraparesis with ichthyosis. If you see a kid who quadriplegic and he had ichthyosis, skin abnormality, chagrin Larsen syndrome, okay, and uh, multiple sulfatase deficiency. And you can see, this is how you can test for this for these disorder. Neurogenerative disorder, Tay-Sac, leukodystrophy, Rett syndrome, hereditary abnormality, trisomy 13, 18, hereditary spastic paraplegia, familial dystonia, double response of dystonia. Do I expect you to know that? No. Do you want to keep them by heart? Please don't. Because this is, you need to keep them in the back of your mind. And when things look at the MRI is normal, no history of HIE, no history of prematurity, mm -hmm. and the kid is not doing well, get, losing milestones, is something fishy, then I have to keep them in the back of my, my mind, okay? Now, what are uh, the, uh, uh, the test or the checklist of lab tests in spasticity? Uh, what, I, uh, what do I need to do? Uh, 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 what do I need to check the kid if he does not have the typical finding uh, or the typical history of patients with, with, with cerebral palsy, then these are the lab tests you need to do on the, on the right side. We just mentioned the disorder. These are the lab tests you need to, to, uh, to, to do on the, on, the, on, the, on the C5 neurological disorder, C5.12 uh, 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 table. Again, please don't keep them in your heart. Just keep them in your mind that there's some, not every kid who is spastic, this is, is, is cerebral palsy. Just keep open mind. Now, looking at the differential diagnosis of, of uh, cerebral palsy, th this, this, this table tell you what are other things that might uh, 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 help you to tell you what is the cause of, of, the, uh, of the cerebral palsy or what look like cerebral palsy. For example, if you have peripheral neuropathy, you can think of, for example, mitochondrial disorder, a biotinidase deficiency. You can think of metachromatic leukodystrophy. Mm -hmm. If you have uh, leukoencephalopathy, that's the other disorder you need to think of. Ataxia, uh, cerebral folate deficiency, an example. So this is more to help you, uh, direct you to the workup of which disease that might look like cerebral palsy or might cause cerebral palsy. If you see a kid with cerebral palsy with abnormal eye, uh, finding or ocular signs, then you need to go through the list and think, uh, look through these disorders that might look like CP, okay? 
Remember, check nerve conduction, visual, auditory function test, auditory function, skeleton examination, urine glycosamine, amino glycan, oligosaccharides in patient with multiple neurological sign and the progressive spasticity. Some brain MRI specific pattern can give the diagnostic clue. Consider the possibility of a brain iron disorder in a patient with a progressive spasticity, especially if episodes of regression are triggered by a fictitious event and even the absence of a specific brain MRI finding, basal ganglia, involvement, and the finding is called eye of the tiger. Okay? Again, this is basically more for me to remember and to keep it in my mind as a child neurologist, not for you guys as to remember. Okay? Now, important practice points. I have a patient who has a cerebral palsy, and uh, uh, you know the things that I need to keep in, in my mind uh, a lot of the time is the prognosis. What is the prognosis for this kid? For example, from the age of, of about two years, it is possible to predict likely motor outcome. And advice can be given about the like, likelihood of independent walking or whether the child will be wheelchair dependent. If you have a kid who's two years of age, just like the kid they saw today, and she start to walk, you know, she has diplegia, you can tell the family most likely she will be walking and most likely she will walk independent. Okay, if you have a kid that two years of age and he is completely encephalopathic mm -hmm. and he has a quadriplegic cerebral palsy, you will tell the family, most likely he's not going to walk. Mm -hmm. And even if he's going to improve, it is unlikely he's going to walk. Is there an exception? There's always a lot of exceptions. Okay, you need to uh, uh, ensure up to date immunization, very important. One, one that we almost always forget yearly influenza vaccine is very important. Mm -hmm. You have to do regular hip surveillance. Why? To prevent secondary problem of subluxation and dislocation. And when do you have problem with the hip in patient with CP? Because you have tight adductors, okay? And tight muscles. And the head of the femur are not pushed against the estabula, so it does not develop very well, okay? Consider the need of the family. For example, has a suitable lifting equipment between uh, equipment provided to the family. A lot of the time the family will come to me and tell me, doctor, I need just a parking permit. I really can't park uh, my car like 200 meters from the hospital and carry my kid on my back to bring him to the hospital. Mm -hmm. Things as small as that can make a huge difference in, 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 in patient care. And believe me, guys, a lot of the time the family, they come to you and they know that their kid is not going to be normal, but they want their life to be, uh, you can smooth their life and you can let the, the kids be independent as much as you can. Now, when a child with CP present with pain or irritability, consider the following possibility. Recurrent infection, especially UTI, dental disease, because a lot of them have a dent poor dental hygiene, especially in our countries here. Pathological fracture, why do we get pathological fracture? Because they are, a lot of them laying down, they are not moving, mm -hmm. and they lose calcium from, them from where? From their bone, okay? And also, there are a lot of them, they have seizures, and there are medication for seizure. Mm -hmm. And seizure medication, what would cause for you? You lose more cats, right? Yeah. So always keep this in mind. Gastroesophageal reflux disease is very common. And the very common cause of uh, irritability, constipation, really common. They do KUB and read it yourself. Renal stone, and one of the commonest, trigger also for renal stone in kid with CP and seizure, tobramate, right? Why? Why tobramate can cause uh, renal stone? It's a carbonic and hydrase inhibitor, right? Just like what? Acetazolamide. Good. Subluxation and dislocated hips, you should be doing surveillance every time. Sleep deprivation, which can cause uh, pain or spasm, and it can be it can be very stressful for the family, so give them medication to sleep. Start with melatonin, for example, and see if this is going to help them. If not, you can move to other uh, other medication like uh, clonidine. You can use that. Neurontin, you can use that. And you can also use, like, sometimes benzodiazepine to let them sleep. Increase intracranial pressure. A lot of the kids, they will develop, uh, you know, hydrocephalus, and they need a VP shunts. So if the kid with CB come with the seizure and fever, Always with VB shunt, always pay attention to the VB shunt. Mm -hmm. Non accidental injury. These kids are at higher risk for abuse. But yeah, they, are, they need a lot of work. 
and not everybody is patient and not everybody you know has the, the, the capacity to you know to deal with these kids so they can get mad and they can abuse them we have seen disasters uh, 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 in, in, the, in the west in the western country changes in home environment school or family that might be impacting on well-being also can cause you know uh, 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 can cause a problem for the kids and remember the, the normal kids when you are at a high stress situation in your life as a parent you tend to ignore them sometimes you need to get you need to take for the, uh, care of other things these kids they tend to be ignored more sometimes they forget to give them the medication sometimes they are in back and they tend to stop giving them the back because they forget about it they are very busy and the kid come with severe spasm and pain now, what are, how can I manage the, the consequences of the motor disorders? The main problem is with me is, 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 uh, is, is spasticity. How can I treat spasticity? You can use benzodiazepines. You can use baclofen as oral medications for that. And uh, 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 you sometimes you can use tizanidine for spasticity. That's very helpful to relax you know, the, the, the muscles. A lot of the time, if it does not work, and if you have less than four large group of muscles, you can use what? Botox or botulinum toxin. What is the mechanism of action of Botox? Uh, mm -hmm. Who's the other one interested in neurology? Yeah. Presynaptic release of acetylcholine, right? Okay. Block the presynaptic release of acetylcholine, right? And if the patient has, the kid is like more than three or four years of age, he has he is spastic all over, he's not responding to medication or the medication are causing him a lot of trouble. What can we use for him? Baclofen pump, right? And it can be very, very helpful, okay? Now, drooling can be improved with medication. Uh, uh, like what? Anticholinergic, ropinol, right? Glycoprylate, the same medication. You can also do what for them? You can give them Botox in their parotid gland. So this, this gland will dry, the parotid gland will dry, and the other gland will take over. So that will help a lot. Incontinence, a lot of, a lot of the time, you need to make sure they are not over impacted, okay? And they, they, they are moving, regular bowel movement. Uh, and if they have, uh, uh, that will a lot of the time help with, with, uh, uh, with, uh, with, with incontinence, whether it's a bowel or bladder. Uh, the trouser overactivity may cause urgency or frequency. We can give the medication against thing, anticholinergic medication. Detropan can be very helpful for this. And the synthetistis usually require uh, 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 fixation by surgeon. The, the, the thing that you really need to pay attention, you might examine the kid at birth, and the kid is not hypertonic, the testes are normal. When they grow up, they go up. So you need to keep examining the, these kids, okay? Orthopedic problem. Surgery is mainly taken undertaken on the lower limb, but is occasionally helpful for the upper limbs, okay? And usually we like to do the surgery when the kids are uh, almost around the puberty. Why? Because, you know, a lot of the time the kid, they will do tender lengthening procedure, they stand up nicely, and two, three years later, they develop contracture again. So you give them Botox, aggressive physical therapy, until they get as close to a puberty as possible, that will help a lot, you know, to, uh, to uh, cut down the number of surgery and also, you know, cut down the number uh, of complications and tend to be more of, uh, of uh, definitive treatment. Physiotherapy, extremely important. I just had a patient today, you cannot believe that she has uh, uh, spastic diaplegia. She has a full range of movement because they have aggressive physical therapy, okay? We talked about the hips. Now, uh, uh, early detection of hip problem can be very helpful, and you also need to do surveillance for scoliosis. Next, please. Uh, scoliosis, sometimes uh, you need to uh, give them uh, to do surgery for them. I usually refer them to orthopedic surgeon who knows how to deal with scoliosis. Uh, spasticity, we already talked about it. Uh, uh, and uh, just to highlight that, you know, in addition to the oral medication or uh, the botulinum toxin, baclofen pump, selective dorsal rhizotomy can be done. And nowadays, uh, they can go uh, into the gast gastrocnemine bilaterally here. 
in the muscles and they can open it and they can denervate half of the of the muscle and that can be very helpful for toe walking okay next what is what kind of, of cerebral palsy uh, is uh, the first one diaplegia right so you are mainly involved where in the lower extremity you can be affected in the upper extremity but it is not a must hemiplegia you are affected on one side what is the common cause for that we just said that stroke stroke, stroke. stroke. Yeah. And this is the most common form associated with seizure. Diaplegia, what's the most common cause? Prematurity. Prematurity. And quadriplegia, hypoxic ischemic encephalopathy, and it is the most severe one. Okay, next. What is this uh, 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 a posture? What do you call this posture? Okay, sit in, uh, on, the, on, the, on, the, on the slide. Spastic quadriplegia characteristic scissoring position of lower limbs due to adductor spasm, right? That's scissoring. So you tend to hit the adductor with uh, Botox. Even though with, with quadriplegia, we tend like to use oral medication because you have a lot of muscle involved, okay? And uh, or uh, baclofen pump. That would be more helpful, okay? Next. What is this one? Hemiplegia. Okay. Next. What is this one? Atitoid cerebral palsy. What is the most common cause for atitoid or curio atitoid cerebral palsy? We just said that. Cranectoras. Do we see it a lot nowadays? No. Excellent. And what is curia? Rapid jerky movement. Atitosis, slow riding movement. Okay? Next. Ataxia. Ataxic cerebral palsy. How do you define ataxia? It's wide based. Wide, yeah. Just wide based gait. Regardless what is the cause, a wide based gait is, is what you call ataxia. Okay? Yeah. Next. Diaplegia, we talked about that. Mm -hmm. And uh, one thing, you know, uh, remember, see, in the quadriplegia, you have scissoring, right? Because mm -hmm. the adductor are hit uh, very bad. But in the diaplegia, even though the lower extremity are involved, you don't have much, much of adductor spasm. Uh -huh. Next. Now, again, we said the base the cerebral palsy is not the end of your problem. You need to do a lot more surveillance. You have to send them for the eye doctor to see how they are doing with their vision. You need to send them for healing, okay? You send them for uh, language, if they need speech therapy, for speech therapy. And sometimes you assist their cognition if they need to. And some of the kids with diaplegia are very smart, or kids with cerebral palsy, and some of them are mentally retarded. Uh, uh, so you need to be aware of the overall status of the patient. Next. Treatment for cerebral palsy. Is there a cure? No cure. Physical therapy, occupational therapy is very important. The braces, mobility tools, extremely important. Benzodiazepine for decreasing spasticity. Baclofen pump, teeth constipation, healthy diet, Botox injection. If you have more than four, uh, less than four large muscle groups, lengthening of tendons with tend to wait until they are as close as they can to maturity, uh, puberty, I'm sorry. Dorsal rhizotomies, we don't do it as much, but sometimes very helpful. And epilepsy, almost you can have children, so you need to be uh, carefully uh, treating the epilepsy and educating the patient about that. Uh, what is the general prognosis for cerebral palsy? Mixed spastic and extra pyramidal cerebral palsy almost never resolve. Spastic hemiplegia almost walk by two years. Spastic diaplegia more than 50% walk by age of three years. Spastic quadriplegia 33% walk by the age of three years. Conclusion, cerebral palsy is a diagnosis of pattern recognition. Cerebral palsy it's associated with a condition called pseudo-degeneration, especially at, at the time of puberty or at the time when you are developing, moving from the uh, main inhibitory output from the brain to a uh, normal output in the first year. That would look like pseudo-degeneration. The mom will tell you, oh, the kid is getting more spastic because we, the, the effect of inhibitory output from the brain is getting less in the first year. And accurate diagnosis is important for genetic counseling. Guys, we had family with three kids. 
three kids with the same disorder because the first kid was not diagnosed well. And one, uh, the last patient I saw that broke my heart, the kid is almost normal. She has only have a little abnormal tune walking. We did the MRI of the brain, it's almost normal. Mm -hmm. We tell the mom she got the disease. What is the disease? It is MLD, and the mom knows the kid will be devastated, and she will follow the same path like her sisters mm -hmm. or her siblings, so she was devastated. So when you diagnose early and you tell the family this is an autosomal recessive or X-linked, your chance one, two, three, four, five, you know, some of the family said, you know, I have three kids, and they are, thank God, they are healthy, I don't need to get more. But if you don't do a right diagnosis, you end up with a family with five normal kids, three normal kids, two normal kids, three, four uh, dying. You know, no matter what the disease, it's always horrible for the family. Yeah. Next. Uh, this is acetoid cerebral palsy. She does that all the time. Slow riding movement with her hand. Mm -hmm. So this is uh, called acetoid cerebral palsy. And uh, this what is what? Spastic. Cerebral palsy, mm -hmm. most likely diaplegic cerebral palsy. Mm -hmm. And look at the legs, what we call this with this gait? Scissoring. No, not scissoring. Scissoring crossed legs oh. and quadriplegic. Okay. In the circumduction gait. Okay. They move the legs out. Circumduction gait. Mm 